We now live in a world with rising religious intolerance. The war against terror has increased hostility and divided societies. Are you frightened that a, an incident would tear us apart as a country? Yes, I am. Singapore is not immune to terrorism. I want to know if the recent attacks by extremists have created new fault lines in our society. I'm scared that they would think me as a terrorist. I'm John Puthacheri. I'm the chairman of OnePeople.sg, an organization that works to build racial and religious harmony in Singapore. In a documentary last year, I confronted what Singaporeans don't want to say about race. Has anyone ever been offended in your show? I'm sure they have. So yeah. they make racist jokes about you? Yeah, definitely. This year, I'm dealing with an issue that's even more critical. Religion. So it means you're still planning your first interfaith effort. Well, as yeah. long as you can remember, yeah. I want to know if terrorism has affected the way we view each other. Uh, I think they're all acceptable. Whenever someone bombs the area, they will scream Allahu Akbar. And it's numb term. No, I don't think it's so real offensive. We're always fearful to discuss someone else's religion. But this is a real issue, and we must confront it. Religious harmony has deteriorated in Singapore. We maybe need to start embracing and not just tolerate one another. Singapore is the world's most religiously diverse society. What will it take for us to stay united? May 22nd. The bombing at the pop star Ariana Grande's concert horrified the world. 22 killed, 120 injured, most of them children. Hi, right, morning, good evening. North entrance, two is over here, or to my right. North entrance over here, or to my right. East entrance goes through where the bridge is. I'm here at the Singapore Indoor Stadium to attend a concert by Sting. The Manchester bombing was six days ago, but Singaporeans are still turning up in large crowds to attend events like these. We don't seem to be afraid. Maybe it's because we know security measures have been stepped up. The rise of terrorism, most of it religiously motivated, has changed our way of life. What worries me most is not the heightened security threat, but whether terror will tear our diverse society apart. I arranged to meet a group of university students who are actively involved in different religious groups. I thought that would be easy considering they're mostly from the same schools. It turned out it was a lot harder than I expected. It was very hard to get everyone together. Is this the first time you all are meeting? Yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, four of us. <laughs> so, so, so it means you're still planning your first interfaith effort? Well, as yeah. long as you can remember, yeah. But why, why is it so difficult? I would think it's a middle or low priority for us. In reality, to be honest, it's a low priority. Yeah. We all need to learn more about one, about one another. But it gets to the issue on how far we we willing to go. Because when we open this gate, we're also opening up to a lot of problems, a lot of disagreements. Because ultimately, there's still some fundamental differences behind the ways of thinking in the world uh, towards like life and stuff like that. What messages are you receiving about terrorism? I don't really talk about terrorism with my family, or at least my parents don't talk to me about it. I do discuss it with my siblings. Like recently, you know, my, my younger brother, he asked me, is it okay to tell people I'm a Muslim? Is it okay to be a Muslim? So of course, I have to talk to him about it and, you know, understand why all of this is happening. How about yourselves? What are you all being told about terrorism? Has anyone talked to you about terror? Actually, it's similar to Naimi, like, with our families and siblings, we don't really talk about it. Parents itself, they just simply say that, okay, there are bad guys out there in this world. And, just, and the dialogue just stops at there. We all don't venture into you know, why behind it. What are the consequences of not talking about terrorism? I really wish that my parents and my religious teachers talk more to me about it. For me, it was difficult because I had to go through it alone and and trying to find information on your own also is difficult because 
everything on the internet is bad, like the news about Islam. These topics are look, looked upon as very taboo. Like we shouldn't speak about, we shouldn't say God, we shouldn't say religion, all these things. The problem is, you're very narrow-minded. The world has become more religious. And Singapore is no exception. We've been swept up by this rising religiosity. Across all faiths, we are becoming more fervent, which makes a discussion about religion even more divisive. Over the years, we've worked hard to build up racial harmony here in Singapore. But religion is different. Race is something we're born into. Religion is about faith and practice. I've brought in Singaporeans of different faiths. I want to find out if terrorism has affected how they see each other. With 10 being the best and one being the worst, think about religious harmony. Think back 10 years ago, 2007, what was religious harmony like in Singapore then? Religious harmony that we have in Singapore today, where do you think we are? I feel that religious harmony has deteriorated in Singapore because of what's happening in the world with a lot of extremism. Ten years ago when we didn't have the, the option of social media, it was a lot more calmer. And right now with the current situation worldwide, terrorism playing such a huge part, and stereotypical terrorism being portrayed in so many channels. It has caused a lot of tension in terms of religion. People associate Arabs straight away as with Islam, so then I'm straight away associated as a terrorist. I think it's a lack of understanding about religions in Singapore compared to race because of how we've been educated in Singapore. What if someone went into an MRT and was held, holding a suitcase and he said, Allahu Akbar? What would you do? What's your first thought? Would you be worried? Or would you just be like, hey, are you praying? You know, the perception is that this guy's gonna set a bomb, right? That's the perception it has, which is not nice because Allahu Akbar just means praise to God. Most of the people felt that our religious integration is very fragile and that we aren't as harmonious as we used to be. Terror attacks outside our country have a significant impact on how we view each other's religious communities. We've always said our racial harmony is hard-earned, but maybe in the emphasis on race, we've missed something. In Singapore, we might have conflated race with religion, but racial harmony is not religious harmony. OK, so now more photos of the Middle East that you're unlikely to encounter in mainstream media. And you can see the women here, some veiled, some not veiled. Uh, some individuals from Iran, so normally it's, very, it's depicted as a very like, dangerous place, very boring. PhD way, student Ko Chun Wee studies Middle East history and has spent time in Lebanon and Tehran. For the past five years, she's been going around to schools delivering what she calls the Muslims are not terrorists lectures political causes. I want you to write down three new things that you learned or that struck you today from this presentation. Well, these, are, these are the feedback slips they have provided to you about what they think. Some of these are really very worrying. Uh, statement here, um, uh, I mean, how, how are they getting this kind of misinformation? Exactly. It's very worrying, right? When you don't have personal experience with a different culture, even though we're in a multicultural society, it's very easy to have these associations. What are you hoping to achieve by these talks? To hopefully bridge in some way that informational and emotional gap between non-Muslim Singaporeans and Muslim Singaporeans. As I do more and more of these talks, I've noticed an asymmetry of knowledge and emotional connect that happens to lie along racial and religious lines with regards to this issue of terrorism, the Middle East. Are you frightened that a, an incident would tear us apart as a country? Yes, I am. We see what's happening in France now. It's very real. It's very hard to bridge the gap after a terrorist attack has happened, after you have actually lost people you know, family members, to a terrorist attack. 
And so if I already feel the difficulties of trying to bridge the gap now, I can't imagine how much more difficult that will be after such an attack. It is sobering to hear what Chunwei has learned from interacting with thousands of young students in Singapore. It's clear to me one religious group, the Muslims, feel more targeted than other groups. It is unfair that all Muslims are labelled as terrorists just because uh, a group of like violent extremists uh, describe what they do uh, as something that they do in the name of Islam as a religion. When a lot of people don't have the time or make the effort to find out more about the religion, they tend to take what they see at face value and what people see is idol worship and so to them, they think that's all there is to Hinduism. You won't see it now, but a few months back, the word terrorist was scrawled over this Muslim lady's hijab. A police report was made and the offensive word was removed. This isn't the first time something like this has happened. In 2015, offensive words targeting Muslims were found scribbled at the bus stop in Bukit Panjang, a week after the Paris terror attack. These overt expressions of bigotry in Singapore are rare. But around the world, hate crime against religion is on the rise, especially in the aftermath of a terror attack. Every hour, at least one person becomes a victim of religious hate crime in the UK. Every day, nearly three people are physically assaulted or have their property damaged because of religious prejudice in the US. And every month, one person is killed in France because of religious bias. In Singapore, we have strong laws that take a firm stance against religious chauvinism so that people of different faiths can live together peacefully. But this doesn't mean intolerance isn't lurking below the surface. This is a very sensitive area I'm getting into. We're reluctant to talk about Islamophobia for fear of breeding even more chauvinism or hate. But I don't think we can go on ignoring it. I want to start with meeting a group of teenagers who have been at the receiving end of this bias. <laughs> Students from the Madrasa al Junid al-Islamia, one of the six full-time religious seminaries in Singapore. And we are involved in a community involvement program where we like to raise awareness on the month of Ramadan. Okay, so we start our our, our meal with this. Okay, this we call the dates. This is for you. Yeah, you can try. Date is, uh... During the fasting month, these students are out on the streets, engaging in what they call street dawah. They approach people to explain what Ramadan is. So, so, so tell me about your street dawah initiative. Around the world, our religion, Islam, is actually misunderstood by others. So with this initiative, we can make them understand us better, that we actually are not that aggressive as stated in the social media and news. When you are out, you know, on the streets. How do people receive you? Of course, they will react differently because of the way we wear our tudo, our long dresses. They will react suspiciously, suspiciously to suspiciously. us. Suspiciously? Yeah. How do you know they are suspicious? Their eyes will look head to toe and uh, I feel that uh, I feel that they were uncomfortable with, with uh, me being around. Do you feel uncomfortable with them? I feel uncomfortable when they react like that. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, it's actually um, unpleasing. Right? When I'm traveling to the mosque, yeah, I will I will wear a long dress, long white dress. It's called a juba. Okay. So sometimes I I take uh, I take a taxi to the mosque. Okay? So every time when I flag taxi wearing a juba, it's hard for me to get the taxi actually. Uh, the driver will will look at me from head to toe first. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then he will drove off. Um, when I was um, in the train, uh, there were empty spaces, right? If there are any vacancies beside me, they won't sit. So so what do you do? Um, uh, I would just ignore them. How do you feel doing that? 
I also have heard stories from others about this, but I think it's a, a normal thing for us already. Normal thing? Because of the misconceptions about Islam. Mm. So uh, we just accept it and we don't really um, talk back for what is happening towards us. But what do you think will happen in Singapore if we had a terrorist incident? There will be uh, disputes among uh, among Singaporeans. Jobs opportunity for Muslims will decrease because uh, as the company will be, they will feel uneasy and unsafe. You heard about the graffiti incident of the MRT, the hoarding. Yeah. How, how do you feel when you hear such things? It makes me afraid personally because um, uh, I, I'm scared that they would uh, think me as a terrorist, but actually I'm not. I'm just a person who goes to a religious school and um, studies like how other secondary uh, students do. People are quite narrow-minded about terrorism because uh, they kind of relating terrorism with Islam. So which is... Uh, which totally that, different yeah, thing. it's a totally different thing. Why do you think people confuse Islam and terrorism? When uh, a terrorist attack, they will always say Muslim terrorism attack. But when there are other uh, races, they will just say a uh, small incident. People relate with Islam it's because uh, they misuse the conceptions of Islam. Okay? And for example, uh, the word jihad, okay? it's widely been uh, misunderstood. Okay? Uh, because the word jihad is very, very wide. Okay? Even when you go to school, we go to school and we seek knowledge, it's, so, it, it's also called uh, jihad. Because it's anything that we do uh, for the sake of our God, okay? for the sake of benefit to the community. Okay? So when, uh, when people categorize as, uh, terrorism as the only jihad, it's, it's a very wrong thing to, to do actually. There appears to be a lot of misunderstanding about Islam, whether in Singapore or around the world. Has the war on terror inadvertently caused a fear of Islam? I've selected a series of statements. Some are by politicians and some of media headlines. But all of them are very public. These are all statements made about terror attacks. None of it was intended to offend. I'm inviting members of the public, Muslims and non-Muslims, to tell me what they think of these statements. Acceptable or offensive? Look at the board. Look at the statements. If okay. they're acceptable, put them on that side. Okay. If they're offensive, you put them on this side. Oh, yeah, sure. Okay, just, just carry on. Yeah. I think this sounds okay because this sounds like a statement of fact because it's really the young Islamists that conducts okay. these lone wolf attacks, right? I think some of this I put as uh, acceptable because I think they are quite factual. It's so offensive. Is this acceptable? Yeah. I would say offensive. offensive. Uh, Religious extremists has overtaken national separates. According to the Global Terrorism Index, right? yeah. So okay, not offensive, not offensive, not offensive. Yeah. Not offensive yeah. Most of them are actually like just a matter of fact kind of statement. Like religious extremism has overtaken national separate separatism become the main driver of terrorism attacks. I mean, if the Global Terrorism Index kind of says that, then it's just a kind of factual matter. It's unacceptable. What do you mean by religious extremism? Okay. It is offensive because every religion preaches to be peaceful. I don't think there's a religion that tells you to hurt people, as far as I know. So why does religion need to be, you know, connotated with it? There will be times where I'll be looking at the news and hoping that if it's a terrorist attack and Islam is not in the same um, headlines, but it's, it always is. I've never seen <laughs> terrorism and Islam not being in the same headline, so... The Arab Spring is over. Welcome to Jihadi Spring. Obviously, yeah, yeah, no, offensive. Welcome to Jihadi. Oh my god, the, 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 the words is like crazy. No, I don't think so. Very offensive. Oh, and a little space now. I'm gonna put it here. Why do you think it's acceptable to, to say, you know, welcome to Jihadi's Spring? I thought it was a subjective statement from an opinion yeah. piece. News terror attacks prompts new right wing calls for war against Islam. It's, it's offensive to the religion itself. Or... I think they're all acceptable. If the Muslims say, look, 
ISIS, they're not Islamic. Because whenever someone bombs the area, they will scream Allahu Akbar and it's an Islam term. Yeah. No, oh, this is very offensive because like why always is a Muslim the one who, you know, being blamed of doing all this. Why? Islamic teams of Malay London attacks that has happened. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if they're accepting the responsibility, as it happened, or oh, it means they're not who do it, then they accept. Islamic State claims responsibility for London attack as it happened. So, what, what do you think? <laughs> offensive, okay? okay. <laughs> oh, well, this is offensive. Unexpected. Unacceptable. Oh, yeah, you're right. Islamic State, I mean, they did claim responsibility, right? When the media covers such things, right, it's not just a sweeping statement or the headline that ISIS claims responsibility. You should have started by this man did this. It should be more in a... Okay, it's not supposed to be very influential or very sensational, but it should be matter of fact, factual. Instead of like putting terrorism and Islam in one sentence, they could actually like say it in another way. Like maybe they can say it just terrorist um, attacks or instead of just... Uh, instead of putting uh, uh, Islam terrorist attacks, they should... Um, respect people the way they are. I mean like, some people consider that uh, every Muslim is a terrorist and there are 2 billion Muslims in the world. If every Muslim is a terrorist, you wouldn't really stand a chance in this world. This exercise has revealed to me just how big the misunderstanding is. There is a significant difference in how Muslims and non-Muslims react to these public statements. Statements the non-Muslims think as acceptable, Muslims find very offensive. Non-Muslims feel that these statements are acceptable because they're st seen as statements of fact. And they find that these are offensive mostly because they feel it should be offensive to Muslims. They may not be offended. But when we asked Muslims to answer these questions, to do this exercise, the results were almost completely the other way around. Muslims agreed that these statements, these two statements were acceptable. They wanted their community to do more, but they found almost all of these statements offensive because of the inappropriate use of the word Islamic or the conflation of Islam and terror. This was very offensive to them. But the non-Muslims couldn't understand why. Very consistently. Dr. Shahid Farid Alatas has spent decades studying and writing about religious conflicts and interfaith relations. I hope he can explain this gap to me. Many of our Muslim participants found those statements offensive. Would you have the same response? I think people, particularly Muslims, are not looking past the semantics. Okay. There are many analysts and many uh, journalists who use the term radical Islamic terrorism, but uh, they're not blaming the religion of Islam. In their minds, the, the problem is not the Prophet of Islam, it's not the Quran, but it's interpretations of Islam. So this misunderstanding where you conflate terrorism and Islam, how dangerous is this misunderstanding? Well, it's dangerous in the sense that it's polarizing. It's, it's a, you know, a discussion that polarizes uh, a nation between Muslims and, and non-Muslims. Uh, and you know, in no country do you want to offend your uh, minority. What's the solution? That people change how they get offended, stop taking offense, or the media has to change what it does? I think a little bit of both has to happen. The media should be sensitive to uh, its readership, right? Muslims have their own terminology for talking about extremists. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, a good example is the term jihadi mm -hmm. or jihad. Now, jihad is a, it's a pure term in Islam. It's a theological term. It refers to a pure uh, inner spiritual struggle. But the term has been um, uh, maligned okay. because it's associated almost solely with uh, extremist um, and uh, you know, murderous uh, yes. groups. Yes. Muslims, scholars, analysts, religious leaders should also educate Muslims. For example, imams in mosques should, edu should, should educate their congregations into, to, to understand uh, uh, what exactly is being criticized so that there's no knee-jerk uh, response by Muslims whenever there's an event uh, or there's an, uh, you know, a media report about that event. When we say Muslim or Islamic extremism, we defame the huge majority who are peaceful and tolerant. And it's dangerous when religious stereotypes are accepted as normal. I'm worried that if a terror attack happens, 
these latent stereotypes will bubble up to the surface. I think Buddhism sometimes gets a little bit trivialized, um, that it is not a religion, but rather a way of life. It's a common misconception that Islam oppresses women. This is a cultural belief rather than what the religion preaches. Terrorism is a problem. So is Islamophobia. Because if left unchecked, it can fracture trust along religious lines. There are Muslims in Singapore who are reclaiming their religion. It's Idul Fitri, the most important religious occasion for Muslims. The first day is usually a family affair, close relatives, very close friends. But uh, I'm here to visit Noor Mastura, and she's chosen to open up her home so that non-Muslims can find out more about her faith. Hello. Mastura started the SG Muslims for Eid campaign two years ago. She links up non-Muslims with Muslims who are open to hosting during this festive season. Everybody is busy, the kids are busy. So for you to get everybody on the table to eat together is so difficult. Mm. But fasting man does that because no matter what, no matter where they are, at that time, they will all want to eat. So Mastura, tell me why you have this program to open up your home to strangers on the first day of Hari Raya Idol Fitri. Because this was the time during um, you know, ISIS and all the you know, terror attacks and all of that was happening and then you know, there was this negative light on Islam and Muslims in general. I think that could be a thing for you know, someone who's, who either don't have a Muslim friend or have never encountered Muslims. Just if you can explain, do you think you need to do this because uh, we're doing well in Singapore or do you think you need to do this because we have a problem in Singapore? We don't have a problem yet, right? But at the rate the news is going, you know, it might be a problem. So a lot of the thing that's going on right now is very much religion related. We maybe need to start embracing and not just tolerate one another. Do you think if after a crisis, yeah. people would be willing to sign up for your program? I can do the campaign, but um, whether strangers would be like, okay, yeah, I want to walk into a house full of Muslims after they just, you know, bombed a certain place. That's a different question. But what I hope will happen is that we don't end up divided like you know other places have been when they have been attacked by a crisis. Mastura's event is not unique. In Singapore, there's always some interfaith event or a workshop going on, if you know where to look. I've hosted quite a few of these events myself. And how do you find a process to engage with someone when they have equally deeply held beliefs, convictions and passions about the same subject. But now I'm beginning to question if these dialogues are enough to prevent religious prejudice. In the Channel News Asia IPS survey that we conducted last year, only 30% of respondents have asked someone from another race about any sensitive issues related to their race or religion. We interact but we tend to stay clear of sensitive issues. When I have a question and no one to ask, I turn to Google. Autocomplete reveals Google's most searched questions. So I typed in the different religions to find out what are some of people's most burning questions. I'm quite surprised and amused at how basic some of these questions are. I invited a group of five friends of different faiths to ask them some of these questions. Is a Hindu a Muslim? <laughs> what? <laughs> so I believe where that question comes from is that's a question I always get asked because I'm an Indian Muslim. Yeah. So, go, so how are you Hindu and Muslim at the same time? <sighs> what does a Hindu wife keep in the kitchen? You may not, you may not be able to answer this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I mean, from what I see in a kitchen as a Hindu man, <laughs> the usual spices, talismans, amulets and all that, it, as part of uh, bringing luck, prosperity and all that. Let's, uh, let's take that and we'll go to the next one, which is uh, about the Buddhists. Oh, okay. Why do Buddhists not eat garlic? <laughs> 
Actually, there's like the five spices, garlic, onions, shallots, chives and leeks. Yeah, because it is something that is very stimulating. They call it like a disturber, like disturbs your mind. Why does Buddha have long ears? Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh dear. Wow, that's a powerful statement. Why does okay. Islam hate the West? Oh. <laughs> Does Islam promote extremism? No. That is my first answer right away. Our biggest purpose should be to worship, so it shouldn't be about creating a state, um, creating a whole new form of governance and all that. Is Muslim a race? No. no. <laughs> these are questions that people are asking on Google. Have you ever been asked any of these questions? Actually, um, surprisingly, no. <laughs> No one's ever asked you any of these questions. Let me, let, me, let me have a good look again. So, okay, so people have asked me, why do I fast? Um, and yes, that's the only one. Tell us about Christianity. Okay. The Christian belief in ghosts. What does what a, Christian a Christian look like? <laughs> like, 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 this, like this. I'm very Christian. I'm very curious. <laughs> Can Christian do yoga? <laughs> I also heard of some friends uh, sharing with me that, you know, hey, can Christian do yoga? Yeah, that was quite intriguing and I went online and Google. <laughs> oh, so, yeah. so this is you? This is you? Uh, you were part of this search? Uh, yes, okay. Your turn, last one. Awesome. Taoists. Uh, why do Taoists practice Tai Chi? Uh, okay, um... Actually, uh, Tai Chi is uh, not a Taoist. It's not a Taoist. <laughs> it's not a Taoist thing. It's just that because uh, Tai Chi was found founded by someone who is a priest in uh, the Wutan uh, mountain, then um, people associate with <laughs> Tai Chi. But would you mind if a stranger asks you questions? Ah, I do mind because uh, typically uh, in Singapore we are just like a closed door mentality. You don't know, you don't ask. Better not ask. <laughs> yeah, you might just offend somebody. So just. Keep your mouth shut. <laughs> yeah, like I know Tai for so long. She also never really asked me. We know each other for 10 years, but you've never asked me about Buddhism. <laughs> I've never had questions about Buddhism just purely by curiosity, um, you know. So I find it that it's, it's a bit sad. The questions sound basic, almost trivial. We had a good laugh, but this religious illiteracy is worrying. We don't know and we don't dare to ask. And that could easily breed misunderstanding and distrust. I need to get Singaporeans to acknowledge that we have a problem and we must do something about it. Where we offer food, we offer water and uh, light. So these are just visual reminders and representations and a good example of why I say we are not superstitious. Very often when I tell people that I'm Catholic, they automatically assume that I'm not Christian, when in actuality the Catholics, the Orthodox and the Protestants are all under the same Christian family. Last year, I spoke to Kenneth Paul Tan to find out how we can build up resilience in our racial diversity. I asked him out for coffee again to find out whether we need to deal with religion differently from race. So I wanted to ask you about religious harmony. Mm. Uh, is there a difference between racial harmony and religious harmony? Is there... Race, we usually don't think of it as something you can choose or change, right? Okay. Whereas religion is. And so there's much more at stake there. Uh, in defending the precepts of religion. So do, right? do you think people are more insecure about religion I than race? I think definitely, because you can lose followers. So do you think we've made progress on religious harmony in the same way that we have made progress on racial harmony? When it comes to religion, I think um, it's, it's, it's a lot harder again. Because, you know, the religious community isn't necessarily very easily contained without, within the nation state, right? Yeah like religious communities are just as connected to their uh, fellow believers in other parts of the world as well. Uh, they go beyond the boundaries in, in a way that's, I think, harder to control than racial elements. How do we go forward then? I mean, we have lots of interfaith dialogues. Yeah. 
there are lots of opportunities for people to talk about yeah. this. Uh, is, is, is it making a difference? Do you think it's I think enough? It, it has made a difference. Uh, the next step is probably to try and engage uh, at a level that doesn't simply um, look for the things that are common in our humanity. We also have to make use of these interfaith dialogue uh, um, platforms to look for the differences. But if we go looking for more differences, yeah. is that going to sort of worsen tensions? Oh, on the contrary. I think the insecurity comes from not knowing. I mean, people don't really know if a religion is naturally predisposed to violence, for instance. We, we don't really know. In the absence of actual knowledge about these things, we can only guess. Do you think we are overconfident about our resilience? I think we have sometimes mistaken harmony for resilience. But we haven't really paid a lot of attention to what lies underneath this veneer of, 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 of peace and tranquility. In the last decade, the number of terror attacks around the world has gone up tremendously. Correspondingly, religiously motivated hate crimes have also risen in Western countries, such as the UK, the US, and France. What would happen when terrorists attack Singapore? I'm going to ask people how they think we would respond and how long they think it will take for us to stand united after a crisis. One year. I think it will cause um, an increase in discrimination. It will take us two years to actually uh, be united again. I don't think they'll be ready to handle the social ramifications of such an attack. Again. So you're, you're worried that we're not resilient because of these sort of behaviours now? Yes. Because like right now, we, I mean, prejudice is ingrained in us so much, and it will become worse when a terrorist attack come, comes, and then people will be like, "Oh, I told you so. I was thinking this all these years. See, it's what they did." Around two years or one year now, because now already they thinking that some of them think that all Islamic people belongs to the terrorist group, so it will take some time for them to change the perspective. I think it's more than ten years. More than ten years. You think it'll take us a longer time than 10 years? I think that like once you have like suspicions of another uh, group of people, even if they are not true, like it can remain for many generations and it will pass down from one generation to another. So it will take quite long. Between 2 to 10 years, that's how much time people I spoke to felt we would need to bridge the differences. If we wait until a crisis strikes, it'll be too late. Global terror is already threatening our way of life. And if we ignore it, we risk becoming divided. Several countries around the world are actively introducing measures to tackle religious prejudice. I want to know if we should adopt these measures in Singapore. After all, we're living in very different times. Should we be taking a more proactive approach? I cannot decide this alone. I need the help of religious groups. Thank you all for coming today. I need uh, you to tell me which suggestions you think will work here in Singapore and which won't work, okay? The first suggestion, in March this year, the EU court, the European Union court, uh, allowed for the banning of visible religious symbols do you think this would work to improve religious harmony here in Singapore? Nobody. I'm assuming everybody's a no. No. Yeah. no. 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 That was quick and no. unanimous. So this is the second one then. Uh, religious quotas in our schools. Sure that every school In the UK, faith schools are expected to take in at least a quarter of students from other religions. Everybody's shaking their heads. No, no, no. 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 Any, any yeses? You have a yes. Why? Because I feel that um, when we have different religions in, in, in a school, for example, that's where uh, we form our childhood. That's where we get to know each other. And there may be a possibility that people will get to know about each other's religion much better. This is a circular society as a starting point. But religion is a private matter. This is a great danger to me. Yes, ma'am. You know, some people might feel that, um, oh, he didn't get in here because of merit. He got in here because of the quota. Most people would say this is not a good idea. So I'm going to put it in the no. 
my next suggestion, which I'm going to go to, inter-religious education program. Do you think this could work to improve religious harmony in Singapore? I think... Uh, Some madrasas are already doing this with study trips to other religious institutions. Yes. yes. <laughs> Show our hands first. Who says yes? Who are they? Yes. Yes, yes. We have a couple of no's, but most people think this would be helpful, I, I am assuming, right? I don't think it will work in that context. The question of authority will come in. So let's say there are four different religions that, we, that we are being learned. So there will come up to a point where we will question like which one is right. Or if the, th if the teachers contradict with one another, which is the right route to go for. So as far as I know, I mean for, for now, I'll, I'll give a no to this stance. No, I think this must be strongly supported. Because you are campaigning for religious harmony, right? Meaning you need to know each other, you need to understand each other, and if you have no knowledge, how, how, how do you... You don't know the other person's faith, right? So this is a fundamental thing that you must do in school. Okay, I'm going to put it in the yes for now, right? So the, uh, this is something that the UN General Assembly has mooted in 2010. Uh, observe in the first week of February, should we observe a world interfaith Harmony Week. Hands up. Support, you think, I will support. Yes, you will support it? We all in support. support. So this is fairly unanimous. Yes. Okay. Not very contentious. <laughs> so we're going to put it. <laughs> it's very positive. To have a religious affairs ministry, a central body for legislation and execution of laws uh, about religion, uh, including registration and governance of religious institutions. I, I will support. You will support that. You, okay. I, I'm not going to support. We already have uh, the Mus Muis, Muslim under Muis. That's right. We have the Hindus under the Hindu Endowment Act. My concern is uh, remember that under the Religious Harmony Act, yes. there's always this thing of a separation between politics secular and, and religion. Yeah, secular. Right? I'm going to put this in the no. Yeah? Um, here's another suggestion we should ban religious descriptions of terrorists and call them just terrorists. Who would support this? I would support them. So, any, one, two, three, four, five. I support. So, mostly yeses, a couple of noes. What's your view on this? Even though we ban it like locally, we will still be, get to read all those from the international platforms. It's not really solving the problem from the root. It might compromise on the credibility of why, why do you ban this information? What purpose do you ban it for? Like, you know, isn't there transparency in what we should get it here? Because I, I'm just thinking that uh, I thought it's good to ban, but um, to omit this news, uh, people can still find it online. So you would go with a yes or a no? I think no. No? So you're, you're changing your mind? Yeah, I'm changing my mind. Okay. <laughs> That's okay. It's okay to change your mind. Anybody else who's changing their mind? No, no, no. I'm also changing my also mind. Also a no. I heard from the young I had to get the reason why I say ban is good because it's being taken advantage of. Okay. We can destroy a society. There are no uh, Hindu terrorists, Buddhist terrorists, and your ter terrorists are terrorists. So I got one, two, three, four agreeing with this, yeah. and I've got five people disagreeing with this. Yeah. So I'm going to put this in the, in the no. When I look at what we've concluded, there are two measures that the group is in agreement about. They want to introduce inter-religious education in schools and an interfaith harmony week. They largely don't want any more bans or any more laws to deal with religious intolerance. Discussing religion is controversial, but with hate and hostility rising worldwide. Tolerance is just not enough. We need to stop being so careful that we don't even understand each other. We need to be prepared to step into each other's shoes to embrace our differences. And when it comes to religion, this can be scary. But we need bold steps if we're going to be ready for a crisis. We've spent 52 years building racial harmony. We need to put the same effort into religion.